Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the play A Raisin in the Sun by Lauren Hansbury. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll examine this play in detail. We'll begin by a little bit about the author herself, Lauren Hansbury, before examining the play's summary, what happens in each act as well as important themes. So let's get started. Now to begin with, let's look at Lorraine Hansbury herself. So she was born in Chicago on 19th May 1930 and she was the youngest of four children. Her parents were well-educated, successful African-American citizens who publicly fought discrimination against other African-Americans in USA society at the time. When Hansbury was a child, she and her family lived in an African-American neighborhood on Chicago's South Side and during this era, segregation, which was the enforced separations of whites and blacks, was still legal and widespread throughout the southern part of America. Northern states, including Hansbury's own Illinois, had no official policy of segregation. However, they were generally self-segregated along racial and economic lines. In other words, African-Americans didn't really mix with white Americans and vice versa. Chicago was a striking example of a city that carved into strictly divided African-Americans and white American neighborhoods. In other words, they really adhered to this strict idea of segregation and Hansbury's family became one of the first to move into an all-white neighborhood. However, she attended a segregated public school for African Americans. Now, when neighbors in the white community that they lived in struck with them with threats of violence and legal actions, the Hansburys did defend themselves and her father successfully brought his case all the way to the Supreme Court. Hansbury herself always wrote that she felt the inclination to record her experiences. At times, her writing, including A Raisin in the Sun, can be recognisably autobiographical. She was one of the first playwrights to create realistic portraits of African American life. When A Raisin in the Sun opened in March 1959, it was met with great praise from both white American as well as African American audience members. It was arguably the first play to portray African-American characters, themes and conflicts in a very natural and realistic way. And The Raisin in the Sun had received lots of um, critical acclaim, including the New York Drama Critics Circle Award for the best play of the year at the time. Hansbury became the youngest playwright and the fifth woman and the only African-American writer at that point to win the award and she used her newfound fame to bring attention to the American Civil Rights Movement as well as African-American struggles for independence from colonialism as well as of course Africans themselves, their struggle for uh, independence from colonial masters in the continent itself and her promising career was cut short when she died from cancer in 1965 at just 34 years old. Now, A Raisin in the Sun can be considered an important turning point in American art because it addresses so many issues that were important and pertinent during the 1950s in the US. The 1950s were widely marked in modern times as an age of complacency, conformism and symbolised by the growth of suburbs and commercial culture that began that decade. And such a view, however, is seen as superficial at best beneath the economic prosperity that characterised America in the years following the Second World War. There was growing domestic and racial tension. The stereotype of 1950s America was a land of happy housewives and African Americans who were content with their inferior status, which resulted in an upswell of social resentment that would publicly find a voice and finally find a voice in the civil rights movements as well as the feminist movements of the 1960s. The play A Raisin in the Sun was first performed in the conservative 1950s and it became really popular especially in the 60s as it explores all of these vital issues and it was seen as a really important and revolutionary work for itself and Hansbury really was at the centre of creating this as it explores not only the tension between African American and white society but also the strain within the African American community over how to react to a really oppressive white American community. 
Also, Hansbury herself has addressed feminist questions far ahead of the time, because it's through the character of Benita that Hansbury proposes that marriage is not necessarily for women, and men, ca women can and should have ambitious career goals. And of course, even in this play, she approaches the abortion debate, and this was seen as something that was far ahead of its time. So there's a lot of important themes and issues that are characterized within this play. And this play remains really important as a cultural document of a crucial period in American history. So let's examine the play in a nutshell. Now this play tells the story of a lower class black family struggle to gain middle class acceptance. When the play opens, Mama, the 60-year-old mother of the family, is waiting for a $10,000 insurance check from the death of her husband, and the drama focuses primarily on how the $10,000 should be sent, spent. The son, Walter Lee Younger, is so desperate to be a better provider for his growing family that he wants to invest the entire sum in a liquor store with two of his friends. His mother objects mainly for ethical reasons. She's vehemently opposed to the idea of selling liquor, in other words, the idea of selling alcohol, and minor conflicts erupt over this disagreement. Now, when Mama decides to use part of the money as a down payment on a house in a white neighborhood, her conflict with her son Walter escalates and causes her deep anguish. In an attempt to make things right between herself and her son, Mama entrusts Walter Lee with the rest of the money, which he immediately invests secretly in the liquor store scheme, believing that he'll quadruple his initial investment. One of Walter Lee's prospective business partners, however, runs off with this money, a loss which tests the spiritual and psychological metal of each family member. And after much wavering and vacillating, the youngers decide to continue with their plans to move in spite of their financial reversals and in spite of having been warned by a weak representative of the white neighborhood that African-Americans are not welcome there. Now to go into some depth on the play. So in act one, scene one, it's morning at the youngers apartment. They live in a small dwelling on the south side of Chicago, which has two bedrooms, one for Mama and Benita, and one for Ruth and Walter Lee. Travis sleeps on the couch in the living room. The only window is a small kitchen, and they share a bathroom in the hall with the neighbors. The stage directions indicate that the furniture, though apparently once chosen with care, is now worn and faded. Ruth gets up first and after some noticeable difficulty, rouses Travis and Walter as she makes breakfast. And while Travis gets ready in the communal bathroom, Ruth and Walter talk in the kitchen. They don't seem happy yet, they engage in light humor and they keep mentioning a check. Walter scans the front page of the newspaper and reads that another bomb was set off and Ruth responds with indifference. Travis then asks them for money. He's supposed to bring 50 cents to school. And of course, Travis is Walter and Ruth's first child. And Ruth tells him that they don't have it. His persistent nagging quickly irritates her. Walter, however, gives Travis an entire dollar while staring at his wife, Ruth, essentially undermining her. Then Travis leaves for school and Walter tells Ruth that he wants to use the check to invest in a liquor store with a few of his friends. Walter and Ruth continue to argue about their unhappy lives, a dialogue that Ruth cuts short by telling her husband, and to quote from the play, eat your eggs, they're going to be cold. Benita gets up next, and after discovering that the bathroom is occupied by someone from another family, engages in a verbal joust with Walter. He thinks that she should be some doing something more womanly than studying for medicine, especially since her tuition will cut into the check money, which is the insurance payment for their father's death. Benita argues that the money belongs to Mama and that Mama has the right to decide how it's spent and Walter then leaves for his job as a chauffeur and he has to ask Ruth for money to get to work because the money he gave to Travis was for his car fare. Mama then enters and goes directly to a small plant that she keeps just outside the kitchen window. She expresses sympathy for her grandson Travis while she questions Ruth's inability or rather ability to care for him properly. She asks Ruth what she would do with the money, which amounts to $10,000, and for once, Ruth seems to be on Walter's side. She thinks that if Mama gives him some of the money, she, he might regain his happiness and confidence, which are two things Ruth feels she can no longer provide for her husband. Mama, though, feels morally repulsed with the idea of getting into the alcohol business. Instead, she wants to move to a house with a lawn on which Travis can play. Owning her house has always been a dream she shared with her husband, and now that her husband is gone, she nurtures the stream even more powerfully. 
Mama and Ruth then begin to tease beneath her about the many activities that she tries and quits, including her latest attempt to learn how to play the guitar, and Benita claims that she's trying to express herself, an idea that Ruth and Mama have a laugh about. They discuss the man that Benita has been dating called George Merchinson. Benita gets angry as they praise George because she thinks he's shallow. Mama and Ruth don't understand her ambivalence towards George, arguing that she should like him simply because he's rich. Benita contends that it's for that very reason any further relationship is actually pointless, as George's family wouldn't really approve of her anyway, they're not from the same social class. Benita then makes a mistake of using the Lord's name in vain in front of Mama, who's quite religious, which sparks another conversation about the extent of God's providence. Benita argues that God doesn't really seem to be helping her or her family, and Mama, outraged at such a pronouncement, asserts that she's the head of the household and there will be no such thoughts expressed in her home. Benita recants her statement and leaves for school, and Mama goes to the window to tend to her plant, and Ruth and Mama talk about Walter and Benita, and Ruth suddenly faints. Now in Act 1, Scene 2, the next day, which is Saturday, the youngers are cleaning their apartment and waiting for the insurance check to arrive. Walter receives a phone call from his friend Willie Harris, who is coordinating the potential liquor store venture. It appears that the plan is moving forward smoothly. The insurance check is all Walter needs to pursue this venture, and he promises to bring the money to Willie when he receives it. Meanwhile, Benita is spraying the apartment with insecticide in an attempt to rid it of cockroaches, and Benita and Travis start fighting, and Benita threatens him with a spray gun. The phone rings and Benita answers. She invites the person on the phone over to the small, dirty apartment, much to her mother, Mama's chagrin. After hanging up, Benita explains to Mama that the man she's spoken to is called Joseph Asagai, an African intellectual whom Benita has met at school. She and Mama discuss Benita's worry about her family's ignorance on Africa, the continent, as well as African people. Mama believes that Africans need religious salvation from what she calls heathenism, while Benita believes that they are in greater need of political and civil salvation from French and British colonialism. Ruth returns from seeing a doctor who's told her that she's two months pregnant. She reveals this information to Mama and Benita, and Ruth and Benita are worried and uncertain while Mama simply expresses her hope that the baby will be a girl. Ruth calls the doctor she, which arouses Mama's suspicion because their family doctor is a man. Ruth feels ill and anxious about her pregnancy, however Mama tries to help her relax. Asagai then visits Benita and they spend some time together. He brings her some Nigerian clothing and music as gifts, and as Benita tries one of the robes, Asagai asks about her straightened hair. He implies that her hairstyle is just too American and unnatural, and he wonders how it got that way. Benita said that her hair was once like his, but she finds it too, and to quote, raw in that way. In other words, in an afro, she sees it as too raw. Asagai teases her a bit about it, uh, however, he also teases her about finding her identity where he becomes really serious, especially with regards to her African identity and maybe discovering this through him. Asagai obviously cares for Benita. He wonders why Benita doesn't have the same feeling towards him, and she explains that she's looking for more than a storybook love. She wants to become an independent and liberated woman, and Asagai scorns her wish, much to her disappointment. Mama comes into the room and Benith Benitha introduces her to Asagai. Mama then recites Benitha's views on Africa and African people as best as she can. When Asagai says goodbye, he calls Benitha by a nickname Alayo. He explains that it's a word from his African tribal language, roughly translated to mean one for whom bread, food is not enough. He leaves having charmed both women and finally the $10,000 check arrives. Walter returns home and wants to talk about his liquor store plans. Ruth wants to discuss her pregnancy with him and becomes upset that she won't listen, he won't listen and she shuts herself into their bedroom. Mama sits down with Walter, who's upset by and ashamed of his poverty, his job as a chauffeur, as well as his lack of upward mobility. Finally, Mama tells him that Ruth is pregnant and she fears that Ruth is considering having an abortion. Walter doesn't believe that Ruth should do such a thing until Ruth comes out of the bedroom to confirm that she's made a down payment on this abortion service. Now in Act 2, Scene 1, later on the same day, Benitha emerges from her room cloaked in Nigerian attire that Asagai has bought from her. 
she dances around in the apartment claiming to be performing a tribal dance and she shouts and sings ruth finds benita's pageantry silly and questions her about it meanwhile walter returns home drunk he sees Benita all dressed up and acts out some made-up tribal rituals with her, at one point standing on a table and pronouncing himself Flaming Spear, and Ruth looks on wearily. Of course, both Benita and Walter are playing on what some could call very racist African stereotypes in this scene. George Murchison arrives to pick up Benita. This is the other man that Benita is seeing. Benita removes her headdress to reveal that she's cut off most of her hair, leaving only an unstraightened afro. Everyone's shocked and amazed and also slightly disappointed with Benita, prompting a fierce discussion between Benita and George about the importance of their African heritage. Benita goes to change for the theatre and Walter talks to George about his business plans. George doesn't really seem to be interested. Walter then becomes really belligerent and makes fun of George's white shoes. Embarrassed, Ruth explains that the white shoes are part of the college staff. So of course, do note the distinct class difference. Even if George is African-American, he comes from a far more established middle-class African-American family. And of course, Walter, who just works simply as a chauffeur, comes from a very working-class African-American background. George obviously looks down on Walter, calling him Prometheus and Walter gets even angrier at him. George and Benita finally leave and Ruth and Walter then begin to fight about Walter going out, spending money and interacting with very unsavoury characters like Willie Harris. They then make up though by acknowledging that a great distance has grown between them. Now, Mama comes home and announces that she's put a down payment on the house with some of the insurance money. Ruth is elated to hear this news because she too dreams of moving out of their tiny current apartment and into a more respectable home. Meanwhile, Walter is noticeably upset because he wants to put all of the money into the liquor store venture. They all become worried when they hear that the house is in Clybourne Park, which is an entirely white neighbourhood. Mama asks for their understanding. It's the only house that they can afford. She feels they need to buy a house to hold the family together. Ruth regains her pleasure and rejoices, but Walter feels betrayed. His dream is swept under the table, and Walter makes Mama feel guilty, saying that she's basically crushed his dream, and he goes quickly to his bedroom, and Mama remains sitting and worrying. Now in Act 2, Scene 2, on a Friday night a few weeks later, Benita and George return from a date. The younger's apartment is full of moving boxes. George wants to kiss Benita, but she doesn't want to kiss. Rather, she wants to engage George in a more intellectual conversation about the plight of African Americans. It seems that George wants to marry a nice, simple, sophisticated girl, according to her. Mama comes in as Benita kicks George out and she asks if she had a good time with George and Benita tells her that she thinks he's a fool. Mama replies, I guess you better not waste your time with no fools and Benita appreciates her mother's support. Mrs. Johnson, who's the younger's neighbour, then visits. Mama and Ruth offer her food and drink and she gladly accepts. She's come to visit to tell them about an African-American family who have been bombed out of their home in a white neighbourhood. She's generally insensitive when talking about this and unable to speak in a civil manner. She predicts that the youngers will also be scared out of the all-white neighbourhood that they plan to move into and insults much of the family by calling them a, and to quote, proud acting bunch of coloured folks. She then quotes Booker T. Washington, a famous African-American thinker and assimilationist. A frustrated and angered mama retaliates by calling him a fool and Mrs. Johnson then leaves the apartment. Walter's boss calls, telling Ruth that Walter has not been to work in three days. Walter explains that he's been wandering all day, often way into the country, and drinking all night at a bar with a jazz duo that he loves. He says that he feels depressed, despondent and useless as a man of the family, and he feels that it's his job to do better than what he sees as a slave's job as a chauffeur. 
Mama, who hears about this, feels really guilty for his unhappiness and tells him that she's never done anything to hurt her children. And she gives Walter the remaining $6,500 of the insurance money, asking him to deposit $3,000 for Benita's education and keep the last $3,500. With this money, Mama says, Walter should become, and act like he's become, the head of the family. Walter then suddenly becomes more confident and energised and he talks to Travis, his son, about his plans, saying that he's going to make a transaction that's going to make them rich. Walter's excitement builds up as he describes his dream house and the future cars, as well as Travis's potential college education. Now in Act 2, Scene 3, on Saturday a week later, it's moving day. Benita and uh, or rather Ruth shows Benita the curtains that she's bought for their new house and tells her the first thing she's going to do in the new house is take a long bath in their own bathroom. Ruth comments on the change mood around the household noting that even she and Walter went out to the movies and held hands the previous evening. Walter comes in and dances with Ruth and Benita teases them about acting in a stereotypical fashion but doesn't mean much harm by this. Ruth and Walter understand her and join in in light-hearted teasing and Walter claims that Benita talks about nothing but race. Now, in Act 2, Scene 3, a middle-aged white man named Carl Linder appears at the door. He's a representative from Clybourne Park Improvement Association and he tells the younger family that problems arise when different kinds of people do not sit down and talk to each other. The youngers re agree and he reveals that he and the neighbourhood coalition believe that their presence in Clybourne Park would destroy the community there. The current residents are all white working class people who don't want anything to threaten the dream that they have for their community which is to stay segregated and separate from African Americans. Mr Lindner tells the youngers that the association is prepared to offer them money than what they are going to pay for the house in exchange for their agreement not to move to Clybourne Park. Ruth, Benita and Walter all become really upset at this information but they manage to control their anger. Walter then firmly tells Mr Lindner that they won't accept the offer and urges him to leave immediately. When Mama comes home, Walter, Ruth and Benita tell her about Mr Lindner's visit and it shocks and worries her, but she supports their decision to refuse the buyout offer. Then, as she's making sure that her plant is well packed for the trip, the rest of the family surprises her with gifts of gardening tools and a huge gardening hat. Mama has never received presents other than at Christmas and she's touched by their generosity. Just as the whole family begins to celebrate, Bobo, one of Walter's friends, arrives. After some stumbling about, he announces that Willie Harris has run off with all the money that Walter invested in the liquor store deal. It turns out that Walter has invested not only his own $3,500, but also the $3,000 intended for Benita's college education. Mama is livid and begins to beat Walter in the face. Benita breaks them up. Weakness overcomes Mama and she thinks about the hard labour her husband endured for years on end to earn the money for them. She then prays ardently for strength. An hour later, on moving day in Act 3, everyone is melancholy. The stage directions indicate that even the light in the apartment looks grey. Walter sits alone and thinks. As a guy comes to help them pack and finds Benita, questioning her choice of becoming a doctor. She no longer believes that she can help people. Instead of feeling idealistic about demanding equality for African Americans and freeing Africans from French and English colonizers, she now broods about basic human misery. Never-ending human misery demoralizes her and Benita no longer sees a reason to fight against it. Asagai reprimands her for her lack of idealism and her attachment to the money from her father's death. He tells Benita about his dream to return to Africa and help bring about positive changes. He gets her excited about reform again and asks her to go home with him to Africa, saying that eventually it would be as if she had only been away for a day. He leaves her alone to think about this proposition. Walter then rushes in from the bedroom and out the door amid a sarcastic monologue from Benita. Mama enters and announces that they're not going to move, but Ruth protests. 
Walter returns having called Mr. Lindner and inviting him back to her apartment. He intends to take his offer for money in exchange for not moving to Clybourne Park. Everyone, however, objects to this plan, arguing they have too much pride to be to accept not being able to live in somewhere because of their race. Walter, who's now very agitated, puts on an act, imitating the stereotype of a black male servant, and when he finally exits, Mama declares that he's died inside. Benita decides that he's no longer her brother, but Mama reminds her to love him, especially when he's so downtrodden. The movers and Mr. Lindner then arrive, and Mama tells Walter to deal with Mr. Lindner, who's laying out contracts for him to sign. Walter starts hesitantly, but soon we see that he's changed his mind about taking Mr. Lindner's money. His speech builds in power, and he tells him that the youngers are proud and hardworking and intend to move into the new house. Mr. Lindner tries to appeal to Mama, who defends Walter's statement, and ultimately he leaves with the papers unsigned. Everyone finishes packing up as the movers come to take the furniture. Mama tells Ruth that she thinks Walter has finally become a man by standing up to Mr. Lindner. Ruth agrees and is noticeably proud of her husband. Mama, who's the last to leave, looks for a moment at the empty apartment, then leaves, bringing her plant with her. Now, when it comes to the themes in this play, the first is the value and purpose of dreams. So A Raisin in the Sun is really about dreams and the main characters struggle to deal with oppressive circumstances that rule their lives. The title of the play references a conjecture that Langston Hughes famously proposed in a poem he wrote about dreams that were forgotten or put off. He, wonder whether, he wonders in this poem whether those dreams shrivel up, and to quote from the poem, like a raisin in the sun. So, of course, this simile is what influenced Hansbury's decision to call the play A Raisin in the Sun. Every member of the younger family has a separate individual dream. Benita wants to become a doctor, for instance, and Walter wants to have money so that he can afford things for his family. The youngers struggle to attain these dreams throughout the play, and much of their happiness and depression is directly re related to the attainment of or failure to attain these dreams. And by the end of the play, they learn that the dream of the house is the most important dream because it unites their family. The next important theme is that of racial discrimination and the need to fight it. So the character of Miss Linda makes the theme of racial discrimination prominent in the plot as an issue that the youngers can't avoid. The governing body of the Youngers' new neighbourhood, the Clybourne Park Improvement Association, sends him to persuade them not to move into the all-white Clybourne Park neighbourhood. Miss Lindner and the people he represents can only see colour when it comes to the younger family's skin, and his offer to bribe them to keep them from moving threatens to tear apart the younger family and the values on which they stand. Ultimately, the youngers respond to this discrimination with defiance and strength, and the play powerfully demonstrates that the way to deal with discrimination is to stand up to it and reassert one's dignity in the face of it, rather than allow it to pass unchecked. Another theme is the importance of family. So the youngers struggle socially and economically throughout the play, but unite in the need to realise the dream of buying a house. Mama strongly believes in the importance of family and she tries to teach this value to her family as she struggles to keep them together and functioning. Walter and Benita learn this lesson about family by the end of the play, when Walter must deal with the loss of the stolen insurance money and Benita decide, denies Walter as a brother. Even whilst facing such trauma, they come together to reject Mr Lindner's racist overtures. They're still strong individuals, but they're now individuals who function as part of the family. When they begin to put the family and its wishes before their own, they merge their individual dreams with the family's overarching dreams. So that's all for this summary. If you found this video useful and you enjoyed it, please do give it a thumbs up. But also, don't forget to visit www.firstreettutors.com. There you will find lots of useful revision materials and revision summaries to guide you when you are studying and preparing for either your coursework or exams. Thank you so much for listening.